Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for coming. Today, I want to set out the steps we in government and you in business, the public sector and the voluntary sector should take in order that we can make sure that the United Kingdom goes from strength to strength, even in the unlikely event that we do not re reach a negotiated deal with the European Union. I'm just back from Brussels after a further round of negotiations with Michel Barnier. We're stepping up the pace and the intensity of our negotiations, and I'm confident that a good deal is within our sights. That remains our top priority. It remains our overriding priority. So before I talk about planning for no deal and the technical notices that we're publishing today, I want to reaffirm what we expect the negotiations to deliver. A good deal with our EU friends, one that works in our mutual interests, and a deal that recognises our shared history and values, but also provides a strong and sustainable foundation for our future relationship. So yes, winding down our membership of the EU, but maintaining our close trading relationship, building on our operational security cooperation, and sustaining the networks of cooperation from research to student exchanges, which we prize on all sides. I'm still confident that getting a good deal is by far the most likely outcome. The vast majority, roughly 80% of the withdrawal agreement has now been agreed, and we're making further progress on those outstanding separation issues. And of course, those settled issues include our agreement on citizens' rights, so that 3.5 million EU citizens living in the UK and the 1 million Brits living in the EU have their rights assured and can carry on living as they do now. Now, on the basis that nothing is agreed until everything is agreed, we've agreed the financial settlement. And we've also agreed the terms of an implementation period to give businesses the clarity and a sensible lead time to adjust to the changes that Brexit will bring, whilst also making sure that people can feel confident that there is some finality to the whole process of leaving the EU. On Tuesday, I met with Michel Barnier in Brussels for the third time since my appointment. We made progress on those outstanding separation issues. We continued our focus on the incredibly important issue around Northern Ireland. And I explained further the UK proposals on our future relationship based on the white paper that we published in July, addressing our future economic partnership, as well as the security cooperation that we want to continue to protect all of our citizens. I'm pleased we've now agreed with the EU to continuous negotiations, as I've been arguing for, to energise the final phase of the, of the diplomacy and to reach a deal that is in both sides' interests. If, as I expect, the EU responds with the same level of ambition and pragmatism, we will strike a strong deal that benefits both sides. And at the same time, naturally, we've got to consider the alternative possibility that the EU doesn't match our ambition and pragmatism, that we do not reach a deal. But let me be clear about this. It is not what we want, and it's not what we expect. But we must be ready. We have a duty as a responsible government to plan for every eventuality. And to do this, we need to have a sensible, responsible, and realistic conversation about what a no-deal situation really means in practice. For citizens, for businesses, for public sector bodies, for NGOs, and we also need to take some steps now so we can avoid and mitigate those risks that arise. So today we're publishing the first 25 in a series of technical notices. They're designed to inform people and businesses in the UK about what they may need to do if we don't reach a deal with the EU. The notices are practical and proportionate. They prioritise stability for our people, our businesses and for our country. They're part of a common sense approach to planning for a no-deal Brexit, and they underline our resolve, whatever the outcome of the negotiations, to chart our own course in collaboration with friends abroad to deliver on Brexit in a way that serves the best interests of the British people. In the notices themselves, we set out clear steps that public institutions, companies and people should take, or consider taking, in order to avoid or mitigate or manage the risk of any potential short-term disruption. The overarching aim of the notices is to facilitate the smooth continued functioning 
of business transport infrastructure, research aid programmes and funding streams that have previously come from the EU. In some cases, it will mean taking unilateral action to maintain as much continuity as possible, at least in the short term, in the event of no deal, and irrespective of whether the EU re reciprocates in practice. Let me just give you one example of what I mean by that. The batch testing of medicines at the, at the moment, they only need to go through one set of checks, either here in the UK or in the EU, in order that they are deemed safe to be used by patients, and that's by virtue of our participation in the European regulatory network. Now, in a no-deal scenario, the UK won't be a participant in the European regulatory network that supports this process, but we don't want delays or disruption to supplies from the EU. So we propose accepting the testing and safety approvals of existing medicines if they've been carried out by a member state regulator. And that's just one illustration of what we would do in a pragmatic way, unilaterally if we were required to do so. It's a sensible approach for two reasons. First, it simplifies the planning for those businesses that are exporting from the EU by avoiding the need at short notice to adapt to new regulations. Secondly, it minimises any potential disruption for UK businesses or consumers on that particular source of supply, in this case, medicines from the EU. Now, of course, given that we start from a position of common rules, we would also hope, and I think expect, in good faith between close partners, that the EU would recognise medicines from this country with our regulatory approval. But in the no-deal scenario, we can't guarantee it. Now, more generally, Whilst we may choose to take this approach to achieve continuity and stability in the short term, let's be clear about it, we'll be outside the EU. We will be free to diverge, but we would only do so when we are ready, on our terms, in the UK national interest, when it's right for the British people. Now, the reason I took the job of Brexit Secretary is because at this crucial moment in our history, I want to see the UK leave the EU in the best possible way. Preferably with a deal, but prepared on any eventuality to manage the risks and grasp the opportunities of life outside the EU. When I was appointed, the Prime Minister and I discussed the importance of stepping up our no-deal preparations. And with seven months to go until we leave, we need to pick up th that work so that our plans are properly in place in time. And that will enable us to build on the substantial preparations that have already been uh, made over the last two years. And I'd like, if I may, just to set a few of them out. First of all, working with Parliament, we've put in place the legislation we need. That includes the EU Withdrawal Act that enables us to take back control of our laws whilst guaranteeing that our exit from the EU is smooth and orderly. We've passed legislation that the UK uh, to make sure that the UK has the legal powers it needs to support British truckers to continue operating internationally. And we've enacted the Nuclear Safeguards Act to provide a new regime for safeguarding our nuclear materials, which will come into effect when we leave your atom. Now, over the coming months, we're going to continue to put those legislative building blocks in place. So that's the first thing, the legislative framework. The second thing we're doing is recruiting the extra staff we need, cross-government, making sure departments have the right people with the right skills to deliver a smooth transition. There are more than 7,000 people working on Brexit. There is funding for an extra 9,000 staff to be recruited into the civil service, enabling us to accelerate government preparations as and when we need to. And obviously just as important as that, in relation to frontline services such as the UK's border force, we are currently recruiting an extra 300 staff in time for our exit, with plans in the pipeline to recruit 1,000 more staff so they're ready to deal with any increase in work. So the legislation and the staff. Thirdly, we're bolstering our institutional capacity. For example, the Competitions and Markets Authority will take on an additional role as the UK state aid regulator, while the Information Commissioner's Office will support businesses with the new data arrangements that we would put in place after exit. Fourth, beyond those domestic preparations, we're making sure we're in the best position to continue key international agreements that are currently linked to our membership of the EU. For instance, we signed a new nuclear safeguarding agreement with the International Atomic Energy Agency, and we struck a bilateral nuclear cooperation agreement with the US. 
Fifth, all of this requires money, which is why the Chancellor committed a further £3 billion in the budget on top of the £700 million already allocated for planning and preparations. So, our laws will be on the statute book, the staff will be in place, the teams will be in post, and our institutions will be ready for Brexit. Deal or no deal. So today's technical notices take this work forward to the next stage. This is the first batch in a series and we'll be publishing more technical notices over the coming weeks. The ones out today will explain how the UK would mitigate the consequences of a no-deal scenario in a range of ways. So for instance, supporting businesses at the border. The technical notice entitled Trading with the EU if there's no deal, published today, sets out how we would ensure that on day one there will be a functioning customs, VAT and excise system, giving advice to businesses on how they will need to make import and customs declarations, register for a UK economic op operator registration and identification number, or make safety declarations on goods being moved between the EU, from the EU to the UK. Next, the technical notice on workplace rights explains the steps we are taking to transfer all EU legislation into UK law in time for exit. So workers will continue to be entitled to the rights they have now, such as flexible working or parental leave. In many areas, we already go much further than the EU. Other technical notices today, published today will address healthcare, including ensuring blood products are safe if we leave the EU without a deal, and making sure that we can continue to import blood supplies from the EU, even though, in truth, we are relatively self-sufficient in this regard. And when it comes to scientific research and cooperation, we're acting to protect UK institutions and businesses. So we set out how we will underwrite all successful Horizon 2020 bids from UK organisations in the no-deal scenario to make sure that the UK retains its status as a global leader in scientific research. Now, amidst all of the technical detail, we understand that real livelihoods are at stake here. So, for example, we're making sure our farmers get the funds that they've applied for, with the Treasury guaranteeing applications made through the EU's common agricultural policy up until 2020. And yes, British higher education institutions should carry on bidding for funding through Erasmus+, Plus, because as we set out today, the government will underwrite successful bids until the end of 2020, helping young people from this country to continue to enjoy the educational opportunities and the rich tapestry of cultural life right across Europe. So too for our trailblazing NGOs fighting global poverty. We've guaranteed their funding from successful bids from the European Civil Protection and Humanitarian Aid Operations. So these technical notices and the ones that will follow shortly are a sensible, measured and proportionate approach to minimising the impact of no deal on British firms, citizens, charities and public bodies. They will provide information and guidance, and after some of the misinformation that's been put about lately, some reassurance. Take just one example of that, the suggestion that a no-deal Brexit could spark a sandwich famine in the UK, or that we've asked the army to deliver food supplies. In reality, our food and drink supply is diverse. In 2016, DEFRA food statistics show the UK supplied half of the food that we consume here at home. 30% did come from the EU, 20% from the rest of the world. Who is credibly suggesting in a no-deal scenario that the EU would not want to continue to sell food to UK consumers? In any event, we've set out practical measures to mitigate any risk of disruption to supply. Through the recognition of EU food standards, our pursuit of equivalency arrangements on food regulation with the EU and indeed with non-EU countries, and through our support for our farmers at home in terms of the financial funding streams. So let me assure you that, contrary to one of the wilder claims, you will still be able to enjoy a BLT after Brexit, and there are no plans to deploy the army to maintain food supplies. I think it's also worth saying that most of the worst case scenarios being bandied around imply that the EU would resist all and any mutual cooperation with the UK. In reality, I find it very difficult to imagine that our EU partners would not want to cooperate with us, even in that scenario, in key areas like this, given the obvious mutual benefits involved. At the same time, in the unlikely 
and I think regrettable event of no deal, a balanced appraisal should recognise that there would also be some countervailing opportunities. The immediate recovery of full legislative and regulatory control, including over immigration policy. The unfettered ability to lower tariffs to bring into effect new free trade deals that we negotiate straight away. And mindful of our strict legal obligations, a swifter end to our financial contributions to the EU. So while we're striving for the best outcome and a good deal from these negotiations, we stand ready to deliver Brexit for the British people if there is no deal. By managing and mitigating the risks, by rising to the challenges and by seizing the opportunities that lie ahead. Now, I think in reality many of the no-deal challenges will affect the EU in similar or the same ways. For our part, if the negotiations fail, we would continue to behave as a responsible European neighbour, partner and ally. And that would extend to the necessary engagement with our EU friends when it comes to no-deal planning. And I think there are already some positive examples of this taking place. You take the dialogue that is already ongoing between the Bank of England and the European Central Bank, it's a sensible illustration of EU institutions working with British ones to manage shared risks for the good of everyone. The technical working group that was set up in April will facilitate discussion of risk management in financial services to provide further confidence in the financial services industry as we lead the EU. There are other areas where such engagement needs to take place, whether between the UK and the EU on data protection, or between the EU, UK and the EU member states, for example, between port authorities. That's the responsible thing for us to do on all sides. We are raising this issue with the EU to impress upon them our joint responsibility to work together to minimise any harm to UK and European citizens and businesses. Those lives, those livelihoods on both sides should be put ahead of any narrow political interests. Equally, that I hope that such engagement on no deal, necessary as it now is, will be rendered redundant by the successful outcome from our negotiations. And I'll be returning to Brussels next week with that in mind, even as we continue to work on our no deal planning. So my message to all of you today is a pragmatic one. Please take note of the practical information that we're providing. Please do stay engaged with us on the detail in the coming months and weeks. And review your own contingency plans. That way, as we prepare for our departure from the EU, and as we strain every sinew to deliver a new, deep and special partnership with our European friends, we will be ready in case those efforts are not matched, both to manage down the risks, but also to grasp the opportunities that Brexit will present. And in doing that, I'm confident that this country's best days lie ahead. Thank you all very much. I'm very happy to take some questions. Um, can I ask for one each, and I'm going to start with the journalist, Beth Rigby. Um, Mr. Mark, you were at Brexit here to promise a better future outside the EU. The no deal option was anything but. What do you say to those colleagues who would dismiss all of this as another iteration of Project Thea? And do you hope these papers will convince them to back the Prime Minister Chatter's proposal? And one other thing I know. You've got just six months to do a deal. How are your stress levels? Stress levels are fine. Um, <laughs> but look, the truth is, as I said, I've been out in Brussels this week talking to Michelle Barnier. We'll be back next week. We're having an extended negotiation next week. Uh, I've been very keen to pick up the pace of the negotiations. So we're absolutely committed to this and we're making progress all the time. There are certainly some outstanding issues, but we're making progress. And I'm confident that a good deal is within our sights. Equally, we have to prepare for the possibility, at least, that the talks uh, uh, don't reach the conclusion that we want. And I think what you're seeing today is not the start of our uh, no-deal planning, but the continuation, because it needs to become more engaged with the public because of the stakeholders that need to be uh, in receipt of guidance and advice. And what we've got is a sensible, balanced approach, which looks at the risk, but I hope puts them in some kind of context and demonstrates that we can avoid, mitigate, or manage them at the same time as making a success of Brexit in the broader sense that I described in my opening speech. John Pienaar, BBC. Um, Mr. Rob, do you 
accept that a no deal Brexit would leave the country worse off and not better off. And the only question is by how much? And if I may, as a, a Brexiteer and a Leaver, you're asking Brussels to, to back off from red lines and if there's no deal to cooperate in the way that, that you want. Did you always envisage that so much of your Brexit plan would rely on wishful thinking? Hmm. Um, so firstly, uh, in relation to the negotiations, um, I'm absolutely clear that the UK will be better off outside of the EU in any scenario over the long term, but I recognise the risks of the short term, and these technical notices are about taking a balanced, sober assessment of that and working out the practical ways to, to make it work. Um, in relation to uh, the negotiations, I, I've always thought this would be a challenging negotiation because you've got two sides. But as I said in Brussels, and I uh, confirm now. We're going into this with energy and ambition. You can see that in the white paper. We're showing the flexibility and the compromises that need to be made. And if that's matched on the EU side, and I've got every reason to believe it can and should be, then we'll get a deal. Libby. Uh, Libby Wiener, ITV News. Um, Secretary of State, Brexit was sold to businesses in Britain as something that would liberate them, make their job easier. But looking at these papers, they're effectively a red tape bonanza that impose all sorts of restrictions on businesses. Um, what would you say to business about the prospect of a no deal? Are they really going to be able to thrive in that environment? And secondly, haven't you actually left all British citizens living in the EU in the lurch because this um, scenario suggests they might not even be able to access their bank accounts, their pensions wouldn't in fact be paid? Well, in terms of businesses, of course, um, the majority of businesses don't export to the EU, but for those that do, and we want to see more businesses exporting, not just to the EU, but to the growth opportunities around the world, from Asia to Latin America, yes, of course, in relation to those in the current um, uh, trading links with the EU, there'll be some extra um, regulatory changes that they'll need to be advised of. The sensible thing to do is to give practical advice and work with them to make uh, that a success. But of course, outside of the EU, there'll be all sorts of other opportunities. But this is inside the EU. There's all sorts of things, customs declarations for all exports, all imports. No, no, I get that, maybe. I get that. But the, the point I'm making is, yes, um, we'll need to make sure as we trade with the EU, in the unlikely eventuality that there's no deal scenario, that we give practical advice in the same way as businesses um, exporting to other countries where we, we don't have a free trade arrangement. But there are also opportunities, whether it's around regulatory control, the growth opportunities from signing free trade uh, deals with the Asian markets, the Latin American ones. And on citizens, well, we'd be working very carefully to, um, with the EU, and, and, and we've had success in terms of the withdrawal agreement about securing the rights of British nationals uh, over on the continent and EU nationals here. And if we leave with no deal, we were going to uh, make sure that we provide as much reassurance, as much practical support to British expats abroad. And if you look at the technical notices, there's a series of information and guidance about how we will do that. But you can't guarantee they can access I've given you three. Well, in terms of contractual arrangements overseas that will then change because we're not considered strictly an EU member state, you're right that there'll be a change. And what we'll do in a no-deal scenario is work in good faith in the spirit of cooperation with our EU friends. And of course, those challenges will be there on the other side as well. So I would think that was a practical issue that we ought to be able to resolve. Francis Elliott from The Times. Sorry, by when do you commit to publishing all 84 technical notices? And isn't your message to land traders across the Northern Irish border, RC Irish government, is that really fair? Uh, and finally... I didn't hear the second one, sorry. Sorry. Uh, your message to, 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 to people trading over the Northern Irish border seems to be, RC Irish government, is that really fair? Uh, and, th and thirdly, um, to whom do you want... Uh, uh, to talk, to whom on the European side do you, should be more responsible in, in this? I mean, the, the European Commission aren't mandated to discuss no deal planning, so who, who, who should be responsible? Are you talking about the Commission or? Well, in terms of the technical notices, we're publishing 25 today. That's roughly, broadly, um, more or less, a third of the total number. And we'll do them in a series, and I would expect them to be uh, out over the coming weeks and certainly by the end of September. And in relation to Northern Ireland businesses, I'm 
that's not the advice we're giving. And if you look at the technical notices, I think it's very clear. We're trying to give practical advice, reassurance, and of course, we'll uh, keep talking in the eventuality of no deal with not just the EU, but with member states. So what we're trying to do is make sure people have the information they need, the lead time they need, and some guidance about the practical way through some of the difficulties in the unlikely eventuality that we don't get a deal. Harry from The Sun. Thank you, uh, Secretary of State. Um, you admit in the technical notices here that the fate of banks, British firms, and British pensioners uh, relies on a reciprocal deal from the EU. What happens if you don't get it? And secondly, aren't you just admitting that in reality there is no such thing as no deal because your no deal scenario planning is to forge a deal with Brussels? It doesn't make any sense. Uh, that's not quite right because, of course, some of the arrangements we might make wouldn't necessarily be legal arrangements, or they may be with member states, or they could be with um, regions of a particular country or their institutions directly. Um, I think there is good reason to think that even in a no-deal scenario, there would be good faith and enough co uh, cooperation uh, on both sides. Why? Because, well, I mean, if you look at the example of pensioners, which you give, uh, the, it, it's hardly in the interest of southern Spain to do harm to the UK pensioners out there. And what you would expect, and I'm confident that we would see, even in the unlikely outcome of no deal, is actually cooler heads prevailing and the kind of practical cooperation to make sure that contractual issues, whether they're pensions or otherwise, are navigated through. Otherwise, in any event, you would fall back on the general rules of international law, including private international law. Well, there are 250,000 British pensioners, uh, 250,000 British pensioners living in, in the EU, and only 18,000 EU citizens over 65 living in this country. I but I don't think realistically you're suggesting, I'm not sure you're even suggesting, that EU would sell out uh, theirs in order to uh, gain some sort of vindictive advantage over the, over the UK. Uh, I, I personally don't think that attributing those kind of uh, intentions to the EU is either right or would come to pass. So, Chris Hope, Telegraph. Chris Hope, Telegraph. Um, Dominic, two quick questions. Why not warn consumers and firms in the European Union about the risks of a no deal to them? Why are all these warnings facing Britons? And you mentioned the safety of the BLT sandwich, which we all applaud. Um, these documents are aimed mainly at companies. What can Britons at home do to prepare for a no deal? Should they sit tight and hope? I don't think there's a huge amount. For the vast majority of consumers in this country, uh, there's not going to be much change at all if it's noticeable. But the issue is around businesses, whether they're exporting, particularly the ones that are exporting. In relation to businesses importing or consumers, things like the approach to batch testing will allow a, a seamless approach, and that's something within our control. Um, in relation to the EU no deal planning, I, I've raised this with Michel Barnier, we have got some good illustrations, and I mentioned them in my speech, where the EU institutions in the UK are working together. We probably need to see a bit more of that. But look, I, I'm focused on the negotiations. Um, we had a good week uh, this week, and I'm looking forward to making more progress next week. I'm going to go on and take... Is there any European journalists that would like a, to ask a question? Oh, no, I, Rob, not quite. <laughs> not quite. Gentleman there, so I don't know your name. Uh, Dennis Storch from the Irish Times. Yes. On, on the Irish border, in the, uh, the paper on, um, on trade, you talk about engagement on arrangements for trade across the land border. Are you envisaging here that there would be uh, a special arrangement for, the, for trade across the land border and the trade between uh, uh, Ireland and the rest of the UK would operate essentially the way that it would with any other EU member state? And secondly, is it your view that the Belfast Agreement obliges the governments of the UK and Ireland to reach such a special arrangement? Well, look, the technical notices set out the practical information that we think Northern Ireland businesses should look at. I think we're saying very loud and clear that we will not allow uh, anything to disrupt the terms of the Belfast Agreement and that we wouldn't return to any form of hard border at the border. And that's a clear commitment and we've got no intention of relenting so from it. Well, I'm not quite sure what that would look like, so I'm not going to hypothetically either rule it in or out. Is there anyone else from the European Press Corps? Gentleman there. Uh, Eric Albert from Le Monde, from France. 
Um, aren't those papers two years late? Um, you know, for instance, you, you take medicines, uh, testing of medicines. Uh, a firm like AstraZeneca is already starting duplicating the testing facilities in Sweden and here because, well, those papers were not published. There was no re re reassurance. Um, same thing for you know, EU citizens. It's a big gap here. Isn't it just coming way too late to hope good face on the other side? I think actually if you look at pharmaceutical companies since the referendum, there's been a number of examples of further investment put into the UK. So I don't think the position is quite as dire as you suggested. But let's also bear in mind that uh, in relation to the uh, s maintaining a supply of say six weeks uh, worth of medicines, in, uh, which is one of the uh, piece of advice that we've put out today. Bear in mind, the government already works with pharmaceutical companies to ensure we've got three months worth of buffer stock for over 200 medicines through the emergency medicines buffer stock scheme. We're used to having some disruption in relation to supply, whether it's because of issues on the um, EU side, not political ones, but uh, for example, industrial action at the border. This may well be in the worst case scenario, different scale, which is why we're taking these further practical measures to make sure that we see continuity of supply. Yes, but the question was, it's too late to bring those kind of papers. I don't think it is at all. And in fact, the timing of the technical notice is building on the two years worth of work that we've already done, and which I hope I set out clearly in my speech, is precisely in order to give those affected, the stakeholders affected, the lead time that they need. I'm going to take, um, I'll take one more from the gentleman here. So on the first um, one, look, th there's no suggestion of bringing the military um, that that would be necessary. And the technical notices set out the practical proposals that we, we've got. So you can see for yourself what we are actually doing. Um, I, I heard the comment from uh, Amazon. It was at the chief, uh, Chevening um, Away Day that we organised to engage with businesses. Um, but I only heard about it in the press. Uh, it wasn't mentioned. He didn't mention it to me. Uh, and I don't know anyone that was there that heard that remark. All I can say is, frankly, um, it's not credible. Now I'm going to take, if I may, some questions from stakeholders. Um, so is there any, are there any stakeholders here from any of the business groups or sectoral groups who would like to ask a question? Is Marta Krajewski, Energy UK? Um, yeah. So one question would be, actually, when do you think we'll move from planning for contingency to actually triggering those contingency planning and what would be the government's communication around that. I couldn't stress more that a no deal scenario will have disastrous consequences for the energy sector and we very much hope that a deal with Brussels will be achieved. Well, I, I share your ambition. Um, in terms of the technical notices, as I said, there'll be um, a, a whole series uh, following on from this batch. I suspect this batch is roughly a third in terms of the precise point at which we, no deal would become a clear and unavoidable fact, that will depend on the negotiations and indeed the, the relevant votes in Parliament. The CBI? No, if you don't want to, that's fine. Thank you. Uh, John Foster from the CBI. Foster, um, Secretary of State, I think the priority for CBI members across the country would be securing the withdrawal agreement to unlock the value of that jobs first transition. I think businesses will welcome some of the additional clarity that they have from these notices. Um, but for many businesses, particularly smaller businesses, there will be questions still left unanswered. Um, in your comments at the end, you urged business to continue to engage with government. Quite a practical question. How best should small businesses do that? Well, thank you for the question and the, um, uh, the recognition of the, the, the progress that we've made. I think for a lot of small businesses, they won't see any change because um, of the proportion that wouldn't uh, export to the EU. But as I said, we want more to do so, uh, whether it's with the EU or the other global markets. And in the technical notices, we set out some of the practical information uh, that they'll need, the guidance they'll need, and we'll continue to engage with them directly, but also through the business groups, including the CBI. Anyone else? Gentleman there. 
Mike, Mike Thompson from the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, Secretary of State, first of all, thank you very much indeed for the announcements today. Obviously, the announcement on batch test releasing is really important to our members, and my members will be delighted about that. And that will be an important step in securing medicines for patients in the UK. And like you, I very much hope now the EU will reciprocate so that that same, that same step can be taken for European patients. Uh, also, like you, we hope that no deal won't be the outcome, and I just wonder whether you can confirm that your department will continue to be uh, pressing for a medicines cooperation as the outcome of the negotiations as outlined by the Prime Minister in the Mansion House speech. Yes, well, thank you um, for that. And, of course, what we're talking about with the batch testing is the unilateral measures that we would take in the... Uh, unlikely eventuality of no deal and if there was no cooperation on the EU side but we would be cooperating with the EU and of course as a part of our negotiations as a whole we are pursuing the associate membership of the European uh, Medicines Agency that the Prime Minister referred to and we will keep that up and we um, are, as part of the negotiations focus on that as well as those other areas whether it's um, on trade or on security where we want those strong links to continue and indeed go from strength to strength. Thank you very much.